glad that you came tonight. So we'll uh, start with a prayer, and then I'll talk through a little bit about what the agenda is. You've got that on the back of your prayer sheet, and, uh, and then we'll uh, go into the workshop. So let's uh, just uh, take just a moment and remind ourselves that we're always in God's presence, but particularly in a special place when we proclaim God's word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please uh, pray with me this prayer of preparation for a lector or a reader of the word written by Father Ed Hayes. Lord, invest me with your power as I prepare to proclaim the marvel of your message. I have prepared my readings. I have tried to take within me the meaning of what I'm about to read. Help me, I ask, to read not just with my lips, but with my whole heart and soul. Lord, make me a hollow reed, so that your voice will be heard by all who will hear me. Free me of excessive concern over my performance, over the impression I create in this sacred action. Convert my feelings of nervousness, turn all my apprehensions into an energy for proclaiming your word with power and authority. May your spirit fill me as it fills the holy words that I am about to proclaim. In, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We have uh, entitled the workshop tonight, To the Ends of the Earth, Opening the Door to Deeper Understanding and More Effective Proclamation of the Word of God. Sounds pretty heavy. But really, I'm trying to get people to understand that we really want to move away from what we, I think, first started to hear uh, after the time of the Second Vatican Council when we started to have lectors or readers who did this basically to help Father out. And really what we're doing as lectors is, is much more important than helping Father out, but it's really taking part of part of your baptismal call to be people who help to bring God's word to the world. And so as we talk about that tonight, we're going to take a look in the little outline about here about really what's so important about a lector. What's the difference between the message and the messenger? And then the four things that I think that are the, really the fundamentals for any good proclaimer of the word, prayer, preparation, proclamation, and practice. And then a few uh, comments about issues and questions and uh, hopefully some time to have you do a little reading here tonight as well. And so we want to start out tonight by, by this scripture passage, which I think is an exciting one. He came to Nazareth where he had been reared, and entering the synagogue on the Sabbath as he was in the habit of doing, he stood up to do the reading. When the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed him, he unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Therefore he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and release to prisoners, to announce a year of favor from the Lord. Rolling up the scroll, he gave it back to the assistant and sat down. All in the synagogue had their eyes fixed on him. Then he began by saying to them, Today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. This gospel from Luke helps us to think about tonight about what we're going to reflect on about understanding more effectively proclaiming the word of God. So we started with a scripture passage that had Jesus proclaiming the scriptures in the synagogue. And there was something about how he did that that everyone really paid attention to him. And so we want to take a look about what does that mean for us as we start to reflect on what this ministry is about. So we want to talk a little bit about what's so important. There's a couple points that I'd like to have us take a look at tonight. Most importantly is the first point. This proclamation, this reading of the Word of God, happens within the context of the most important thing that we do. And that's gathering around the table of the Lord, around the altar, to celebrate the Eucharist. That, for us, as Roman Catholics, is our identity. It's who we are. So I always find it really interesting when having a conversation with people and say, oh, I'm Catholic. I say, oh, really? I said, what parish do you go to? Well, I don't really belong to a parish. Well, uh, where do you go to church? Well, I really don't go to church. Well, 
Do you celebrate Eucharist ever? Well, you know, a couple times a year, maybe Christmas and Easter. I don't know how you can be Catholic without Eucharist. It's really the foundation of who we are. And so what you are about tonight is about proclaiming that scripture in the context of the most important thing that we do. So keep that as your primary thing to think about tonight, that it's in the middle of our Last Supper that you are helping to bring the nourishment of God's word to the people who come to worship together. What you do happens in what we call the context of the ministry of worship. And so, you know, uh, people come to Mass to celebrate Eucharist from a lot of different perspectives. Some do because, oh, it's my duty. I got to go. It's Sunday or it's a holy day. But really the foundation of what this is, it's worship. It's giving praise to God. So, so no matter what the reading is, even if it's a reading that's, that's full of a lot of hard sayings, it comes to us in the context of giving God praise. And so it's part of our ministry of worship. Proclaiming God's word is part of the ministry of worship. There's something interesting about worship because it has both a personal and a communal dimension. And so it more, most importantly, when we come together to celebrate in a church the Eucharist, we are celebrating as a community. So it's, it's pretty hard to, to speak of coming to do my mass because it really isn't my mass, it's our celebration. It's our Mass. I like to think of, of those who like to come and, and celebrate Eucharist sometimes, uh, and they kind of come to their place and say their prayers and do their reflections. Uh, it's, it's kind of like going to the Last Supper and asking for a table for one. You know, oh no, I'm not going to sit with the rest of the guys. I think I'll sit over here. It would have been very absurd to go to the Last Supper and to sit by yourself to do your thing. The communal dimension of what this is is Christ calls us as a church. But the personal part is what we bring. And so it's both the personal and the communal dimension of what we do. And so your proclamation of God's word would be much better as if you have a personal relationship with the scriptures before you come. That you start to kind of read them so that you put on the mind of Christ so they come to make some sense to you in a bigger context. Then when you come to help the assembly understand what the scripture is about, they'll mean a lot more. So you're not just reading for yourself, you're not just reading for Father, it's really coming to proclaim for all the people who are gathered, helping them to better understand God's word. And in that sense, it's more than technique. If this was just about practice, really, you could get the readings online, which you can get, and you could just practice them at home, and if it's just about technique, we could do a little cheat sheet, give you the technique, you could do that, and you wouldn't have to worry about coming to a meeting like this. But the formation is for us to understand that it's bigger than just technique. It's my spirituality, and it's what I really bring to the Eucharist. So with that in mind, we want to move on then to say then it's about an effective proclamation that really helps the assembly to really hear the scriptures. In the best setting, people would never want to read along in a missalet or in a, in, in a hymnal because they would be riveted on you. Why have about 500 people come together in a church where somebody gets up, makes no eye contact, reads the readings like this, and everybody else has their heads down? That's really not proclamation, that's reading together. It's not really what a lector does. It's about helping the assembly to really hear the scriptures. And ultimately, we bring our spiritual lives. We bring our spiritual lives to what we are reading and what we are proclaiming. Isaiah says, the Lord God has given me a well-trained tongue that I may know how to speak to the weary a word that will rouse them. Now there is a job description for a lector. There's a real vocational call to speak a word that will rouse them. There's nothing more disheartening than to have a lector get up to the ambo with a really powerful reading and say, the Lord was very angry. You think, okay, let's have a little emotion in what's going on. Let's kind of convey the sense of what the, the reading is really about. And so we need to reflect a little bit on the message as well as the messenger tonight. The message is focused on God. And so when we get up, it's really not about us. 
It's about the message that we bring. So it's reverence for God's word. It's understanding the sense of the scriptures. It's being open to the spirit of the scriptures and letting the word of God form me. So when I say that we have a reverence for the, for the word of God, it's really even how we approach the ambo, how we approach the lectionary. Uh, is it just another book, something that we kind of pull out of a drawer someplace and call in under our arm? Or do we really look at it as being God's word and so it's sacred? One of the times that that was brought home to me most clearly was someone from a different faith tradition. We were in a college setting, and one of the readers in an ecumenical setting was a Muslim. And he came in before the ceremony, and he said, where can I prepare to do my reading? And I said, well, you can just come in here. So he came into the sacristy, and he took his shoes off, and he washed his hands. He did a purification ritual. Then he took his scriptures out that were all wrapped up in a beautiful cloth and he put it on a table and he unwrapped it and he took it out and he kissed it then he opened the book he had a tremendous reverence not just because it was a book but for what the book contained a real reverence for scriptures and so when we talk about that in our own life it's reverence for the word of god but it's understanding the sense of the scripture so it's not just the words it's not just getting through the words but it's the meaning, being open to the spirit, kind of helping us to understand so that it can form us. Now the messenger then focuses on the assembly. The only reason that you sign up, the only reason that you're trained, the only reason that you volunteer to, to be a lector is for the sake of the assembly. And so that's really why you want to be good at your craft, why you want to get the fine points down, why you want to get the little things taken care of, because it's for these folks. If they can't understand you, if you can't bring life to the scriptures, if, uh, if this is just kind of doing my part and then I sit down and the rest of the mass goes on, then it really is not the fullness of what a lecture could ever be. There's nothing more exciting than to have someone get up, especially if I'm going to preach on that word in a, little, in, in, in a few moments, to have a lecture get up and absolutely go to town with the reading really get people's attention, really help people to understand it, because then it comes alive. There are some times if the lector proclaims the word poorly, that when it comes time that I have come to preach on that part of the passage, I have to reread it. I have to reproclaim it to the assembly because it was lost. And so the reason that we do that is it's a service to the community, and the role is to proclaim, not to read. You read the newspaper, you read a sign as you go by. But proclaiming means we have a different energy, and we have a, we have a different tone in our voice, we, and we have a different understanding of what we're doing. We proclaim it so that the people might hear, and hear is more than just auditory. Okay, It's what we hear with our hearts and what we hear with our minds. And that's what you help us to do. So how can I do this? Well, it really comes to me, I think, in these four areas when we talk about Prayer, preparation, and proclamation. We want to talk about those first. First about prayer. If prayer is ultimately about worship of God, if it's about deepening our relationship with God, deepening our relationship with the community, and growing in holiness and conversion and sanctification, then I need to make sure that the only time that I pray is not just when I come to Mass on Sunday. Sunday should be the apex should be the mountaintop experience of what I try to do every day. It's about staying in relationship with God. And so the more I can be a little bit more attentive, particularly if you know you're going to be on to read in the, this, this, this coming weekend. So if you have a weekend coming up, then you really want to kind of focus your prayer to help to prepare yourself spiritually for this. I know that a lot of times what happens is you show up before Mass, they're shorter reader and say, hey, can you read? And you say, yes. You run in, you run through. Do I have any big words? No, God and Jesus, I can get through that. And so then we kind of get through. But that's, that would be the lowest common denominator. That's not the way we want to do it all the time. We want to be able to bring our best spiritual selves to this. So it's about growing in holiness, in conversion, the change that happens in our life, and sanctification. It's also understanding that there's a difference between private prayer, the things that I want to pray for, and then what happens when we come together for our public prayer. And so that's when we come together to pray. And so the celebration of, this, of the Eucharist then is the source and summit of our faith. 
So before Mass or after Mass, I pray my prayers. During the week, I do my preparation. But when we come together then, this is about leading the assembly. And the, the lectors are one of the people who help to lead the assembly in that kind of prayer. Now, the second part of that then is there's no substitute for preparation. There's no substitute for preparation. So the ministry of the lector is rooted in prayer, but it begins as a participating member of the gathered assembly. And so sometimes if I'm at a church and I come in and I see the lectors and they're sitting off to the side and uh, maybe we're, we're doing the prayers or uh, supposed to be responding and the lector sits and doesn't participate uh, and gives the impression that, well, I'm just gonna wait until my part, then they kind of come up and they come up into the sanctuary and they kind of come alive and they do their part and then they go back to their place and they don't participate anymore. Everybody, the presider, all the liturgical ministries are first members of the assembly. So that means we all sing. We all sing the opening song. We all do the prayers. We all recite the creed together. And so that's one of the things because you are a worship leader. And so part of that is to make sure that you are participating in the mass just as everybody else is. Then the ministry of the lector relies on reading and meditating on the scriptures. And so that's, that's part of that preparation that happens ahead of time. And one of the things sometimes that really changes how you read a reading is you may get, for example, in, in the pastorate here, we many times will send out, out of the lector workbook, the reading that you'll do. But if you take that reading and then open your Bible and read that same section and read what's right before it and what's right after it, you go, oh, I understand this now. Because you only get a cutting, a pericope that happens on any given mass. But when you, or if you even have time to read the whole chapter or the whole section, oh, then it comes alive in a whole different way. So it's reading and meditating on the scriptures. Another few points about preparation are really some nitty gritty things. And the first thing is to understand sound systems. Sound systems are not a substitute for your voice. The sound system is to reinforce what people are already hearing. So one of the things that, that everybody who's going to lecture needs to do, not just on the Sunday that, they practice, that, that they're going to uh, be, be the lecture, but you really need to go to your church and practice on the microphone. You need to be comfortable hearing your voice over a sound system. Sometimes people will go up and they go to the ambo and they start the reading and they hear the voice and then they back way off. It's kind of like, ooh. No, the idea is, is for them to be able to hear you and to understand you. And you need to be comfortable with that. One of the